Okay. A priest, an imam, and a rabbit walk into a blood bank to donate blood. The rabbit says, I think I'm a type O. That's all I got. <laughs> there was a meme that was going around on Facebook in the days and weeks before Shoshana. It went like this. Someone wrote, I feel like after the year we've all had, our rabbi should be able to stand up on Rosh Hashanah and exclaim, I am so overwhelmed I don't know what to say, and we'd all kind of nod and say, L'chaim, I'll drink to that. <laughs> I'm tempted, and I don't think anybody would complain. Because there certainly is so much swirling around us, and I and my colleagues and friends and rabbis around the country kept writing and rewriting ideas for sermons every time the headlines changed. We focused on Afghanistan, broken politics in our country, wildfires, a warming planet, new laws that threaten democracy. Every headline is worthy of a sermon. This sermon will be about none of them. To prepare for this sermon, I asked a colleague if he had a story of the email he never sent, the thing he really wanted to say in the moment, but instead held back. He responded, that's the story of my life. And I would say of this very dear colleague, it's been a good life and an exemplary career. And I don't think that's an accident. We know that what we say and what we do impacts our lives and others' lives and the world around us. It's also the case that what we do not say, what we refrain from doing, can shape reality. And it's the essence of what it means to be human. Humans can hold back. Most other species just follow their instincts and urges. Sometimes, the right slogan is, don't just do something, stand there. And in life, and certainly through the values of the Jewish tradition, just standing there can sometimes be the sign of the greatest strength. Now that I mentioned a friend and a colleague, someone who's only uplifted me in my life, let me move on to someone who, for years, brought me terribly low. My childhood bully terrorized me. I couldn't escape him. I was afraid of him physically. I suffered from him emotionally. Once in third grade, and this story is not embellished, during recess, we were on opposite sides of the kickball court. He walked by me as I was walking back in. Sucker punched me in the stomach knocked the wind out of me, and then he smirked as we were both brought in to spend the rest of recess with our teacher, Mrs. Shapiro, as punishment for having fought. He was that kind of kid. And I'm confident that there's a piece of my instinct towards treating people, I hope and pray, right and kindly, that was forged in the crucible of his mistreatment of me. So maybe I should have some odd sense of gratitude to him. But I don't feel it. Forty years later, I remain angry that he did it and that he got away with it over and over again, and that he went on with his life. Coincidentally, two boys from Little Woodbridge, Connecticut, 
went on with their lives, and both ended up in Los Angeles. And some years ago, I realized that happenstance had put us again in the same location. For months, I agonized about whether to connect with him. For what purpose? Just to say hello? To reminisce about the good old days in Ms. Shapiro's classroom? Maybe to get an answer to this burning question, why? Why did you feel the need to do that to me? Or just to let him know that he'd injured me and maybe eke out a thin, delayed apology. I messaged him on Facebook. We decided to meet for coffee off of Santa Monica Boulevard. I rehearsed my speech in my mind for days. It would be respectful, but pointed. It would be fair, but honest. I would unburden myself and he would feel appropriately burdened. <laughs> maybe some closure, maybe a tiny bit of contrition, and even if not, some satisfaction. I had not seen him since high school graduation in 1990. He arrived at the restaurant after me. I was already sitting there. He walked in. He approached me like old friends. He gave me an oddly normal hug, and we sat down. I looked into his face to find some recognition. Did he remember? Did he even know? Was it part of his consciousness what he did to me, or might it really be that he just thought he was reconnecting with a kid from the old neighborhood? As the meal went on, my urge to unload on him waned, as if a tidal wave that had been building for decades just disappeared. I held back, not because I was afraid, but because I realized I had the power to, and I understood that I had done the work myself. I realized that telling him and telling him off was not what I needed to do. What I needed to do, I had already done which was to emerge stronger and to live my life wildly different than he had lived out his childhood. My restraint in that moment was the perfect antithesis of his lack of restraint back then. And the venting might have been gratifying, a great endorphin rush. But this man seemed to be living a noble enough life at this point Rehashing his sins upon me from ages 7 to 15 or so would bring neither him nor me anywhere meaningful. I would save and protect no one. So I continued with the banal chatter, and we split the check. I said it was nice to see him, and I walked away. I can't tell you his name, by the way, but it rhymes with... No, just kidding. <laughs> For years, I had fantasized about that moment and what it would feel like having these words of righteous rage emerge from my mouth. It would have felt like the powerful sense of clarity and victory you are certain you will experience if you momentarily and intentionally lose your composure and allow yourself to yell at a child or a student or a spouse or a parent that kind of faux clarity that obscures in the moment what's important and what is needed. And it's rarely the yell. In this case, with my bully, what was needed was the rehearsal deep in my mind and deep in my soul. It was the internal work that was significant. Amazing things become clear and possible when you hold back, when you reconsider and wait and choose not to speak. Choose for the moment not to do. Perhaps to find out that there are better uses for your words and your actions. Now it can feel like weakness to hold back. In that coffee shop by Santa Monica, did I cower from my bully one more time? I don't think so. Because again, sometimes doing nothing means everything. Now, we confront this notion in classic Jewish texts, including the very often quoted line from Pirkei Avot, 
Eza Hugi Bor, who is a hero? Who is mighty? Who is strong? You can imagine other ancient texts having answered that question, the one who wields his weapon with valor, the one who vanquishes his foe. But the Mishnah's answer, and the wisdom of the rabbis is not that. They answer it, Hakovesh et Yisro, the one who vanquishes his own urges, the one who holds back, the one who doesn't attack every time, who does not submit to every urge, the one who realizes that the words not said are some of the most important ones. Now, some in the tradition understand this line to mean that conquering one's yetzer hara, one's evil impulse to be violent or to be licentious or to steal, that that is the mark of heroism. But at least one commentator reads it much more broadly. The 19th century Rabbi Israel Lifshitz from the town of Danzig, which depending on what year it was, either Poland or Germany, he links this line with three other similar ones in the same text. And they ask who is rich, and who is wise, and who is happy. And Rabbi Lifshad says that what the Mishnah is teaching us, that often the way to get what we desire is the opposite of our momentary instinct. And he gives an example. Imagine, he says, somebody who wants to be known as wise, and thus refuses to learn from others, lest that person be thought of as lacking wisdom. Otherwise, he wouldn't need to learn, right? And so what happens? No wisdom comes. Same with heroism and strength, he says. It seems to you that you gain it by expressing it, by downing your foes. But what does it look like to others? It looks desperate. It smacks of evil. There's violence, yes, but no heroism. So to conquer one's yetzer at times is not to do the say, not to do or say the things that are circumstantially warranted in the moment in order to transcend the smallness of that moment and thus live with bigger possibilities, with a bigger heart. Maybe that's living towards the life of a hero. Such moments of restraint can loom large and like the still small voice that we're gonna reference in the Unatana Tokef in just a few minutes, at times they are whispers, but no less profound. I've spoken many times from the Bhima and written about my exquisite week learning meditation and qigong, this Chinese body posture, at the Holy Isle in Scotland. And much of the learning came from what we did and the postures we practiced and held and the words of the guided meditations and the questions we asked of one another and of our teachers. But some of the illumination came from what we didn't do and what we didn't say. Several times a week at that retreat, we were asked to have a meal in noble silence, a zone of quietude. We got our food, sat down at the normal tables, across from one another, next to one another, and ate. At first, I gotta tell you, it was very weird to not speak to the person across from me. It felt a little bit like that scene from the Frisco Kid, if you get my reference, in the convent, right? The salt, pass the salt, please. <laughs> it almost seemed rude, even though I knew it wasn't. Do I make eye contact? Holding quiet eye contact can be jarring. But eventually I slipped into a deeper zone, very awake, very alert, oddly and reassuringly meditative. I heard myself chew. I tasted tastes in my food that had been totally obscured to me before. I ate with kavana, intentionally. I experienced the meal as nourishing in a way that I rarely do, as if each morsel were a treat. And I made and I held eye contact with those in my cohort, sometimes locking gazes for five to 10 seconds. And lots was communicated in those extended moments, even without speech. And within the cocoon of quiet, my mind leapt and explored and conjured ideas and images and even feelings that I'm sure would have been utterly elusive had I filled up those moments with, how was your last session? Remind me where you're from again. In those moments, I was not quashing some evil impulse, but I was conquering an urge of sorts, an urge that is spurred and sometimes demanded by our garrulous society and our relentless spoken on, uh, focus on the spoken word. 
and our cultural demand that we do, that we respond, that we react every single time. Now, the question is, can we hear the counter-cultural call? Don't just say something. Sit there. Now, to be clear, this is not an exhortation to passivity, to achieving courage by doing nothing, to stay quiet or complacent, God forbid, in the face of evil or outrage. There are plenty of junctures in life where such acting and speaking is warranted and holy and a true obligation. I'll share a recent and painful and also hopefully inspiring example. Many of you know how important USY, the conservative movement's youth group, was to me in the formation of my Jewish identity. And at Beth Am, we are so proud of our own chapter and how our kids have learned to lead and to love and master Judaism through it. A few weeks ago, as I shared in an email to the congregation, a terrible, painful scandal emerged from within our dear USY. A former active USYer from the New York area, who's currently a rabbi, wrote an article in the Times of Israel detailing years of sexual abuse by a well-known and beloved USY staff member. And after the article came out, more victims came forward. There might be dozens, there might be hundreds more. The accusations are incredibly hard to read through. They detail a male staff member taking advantage of the very safe and beautiful intimacy that USY is meant to foster and which it certainly did and safely did for me and many tens of thousands of others. But this staff member abused that trust and intimacy in horrific ways. These sins, and they are sins by the perpetrator, and those who may have covered it up are severe. I feel bonded to this awful story in so many ways. And USY has some hard and very painful work to do in order to achieve tshuva, repentance, and earn our trust that its programs and its conventions and activities remain safe spaces here and everywhere. That reckoning is painful, it's traumatic, both for those victims reliving their abuse and for those associated with USY who are confronting some ugly truths. And the reckoning is a mitzvah. And it will happen only because one brave victim at first chose not to hold back, he elected not to not speak. He resisted the understandable urge to stay quiet and thus perhaps spare some shame for the organization that he loved and helped create the rabbi and Jew that he is today. He realized that his si silence in this case would be anything but noble. This is a poignant example of the sanctity of acting out, saving lives as a result. Here is someone choosing not to just stand there, but to do something. Judaism venerates both stances. The psychologist Jung wrote about the duality of man pushed relentlessly by often opposing instincts deep in our psychology and anthropology. And in our tradition, the God of Genesis is the one who creates worlds with word and deed. And to imitate that God, we've got to act, and we've got to do, and we've got to speak. And the God of the Kabbalah is venerated as one who did sim tsum, who held back, who restrained, who literally made God's self smaller in order to make room for the world, for us, to see what could emerge in the vacuum. That's also a God that we must emulate. And the art is knowing which moment calls for which. When to call out with righteous activity. And when to surrender the momentary and temporarily very satisfying thrill that comes with a cleverly placed word, a lightning strike, in the name of a greater possibility of healthy bonds with you and your loved ones and with society itself. The Ramban, Nachmanides, the great 13th century Spanish rabbi, he names this notion of sacred restraint as the prime pathway to a religious life. He's commenting on the verse from Leviticus, Vayikra, which commands us, Kedoshim you, be holy. And first, the Ramban, the Ramban does his favorite thing to do, which is to quote his predecessor Rashi and tell us why he thinks Rashi is wrong. Rashi says this notion of restraint is specific to prohibited things, immorality, and depravity and dishonesty. 
The Ramban valorizes this restraint as a much broader concept. In his words, quote, this abstinence does not refer only to restraints from acts of immorality, but is rather the self-control mentioned throughout the Talmud. He even connects the base, this basic human stance, this honed self-limitation, to the name by which the rabbis of the Talmud were originally known. You might have heard in your studies of the word Pharisees, referring to the early rabbis. Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word prushim, those who hold back, those who separate themselves from their urges. Those, in other words, who do not do everything they feel the urge to do. Those who do not say every word that comes to mind. Those who live in that human realm separated, prushim, from all others in the animal kingdom. Those who can consider a moment and pause and choose not to say it, not to yell, not to press send even though it would feel good in the moment, because the moment will pass and there are greater vistas to explore. I think we all must be circumstantial and strategic Pharisees, knowing when we should not just do something or say something, but rather stand there, sit there, and watch the horizon for what might emerge. There's an iconic and painful family story in my extended family narrative that speaks to this idea. It has to do with a woman in our family who was having a squabble with her adult daughter over what else? Money and inheritance when there was plenty of funds to go around. And the squabble got so painful that the adult daughter, who I don't think was in the right, basically separated her own mother from her kids, removing from her mother the chance to be a grandmother. At some point, she even told her children that the grandmother was dead. And the grandmother in this situation was forlorn, which you can understand why this was her only child and therefore her only grandchildren. And she was determined that she was actually in the right here, and she probably was. And she went to seek counsel from my grandparents, who were very wise people. And she sat in front of them and explained the predicament. Again, said, what should I do? Should I sue? Should I counter sue? Should I act as I deserve to act? And they said to her the following sentence. You can do, and you can be right, or you could be a grandmother. In other words, you can be correct, you can do what you deserve to do, what you've earned the right to say, or you can shoulder it painfully, nobly, and end up living out a richer life with yet more of the things and the people that you deserve and that you need. And that's the path that she chose. And she got her grandchildren back. We confront such junctures all the time with childhood bullies, with coworkers or loved ones who push our buttons. Even within ourselves, the battle rages to respond to every individual need that bubbles up, to imitate the divine doer and the divine creator, or maybe to mimic the holy restrainer, to make our mark by doing and saying, and for now, winning this moment's battle, or to make a yet more sacred and enduring mark by what we choose not to say what we agree not to do, and thus transcend the language of battle and finally and deservedly live a life of peace. And in this ongoing dance between being pulled, between doing and not doing, volume or quiet, we can be inspired by this extraordinary poem by Adrian Rich, the great 20th century American poet. She wrote, the technology of silence, the rituals, etiquette, the blurring of terms, silence, not absence. Silence can be a plan rigorously executed, the blueprint to a life. It has a presence, it has history, a form. Do not confuse it 
with any kind of absence. I wish you all a Shana Tova.